Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Edmondson Heights Baptist Church this morning as we come to worship our great and awesome God. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's good to see all of you here today and uh, to also know that there are those who are joining us on our live stream. We just uh, invite you to uh, come and be a part of us here as you tune in and um, and uh, we pray that as you are uh, sitting in your home today that you would be a, feel a part of this uh, forever family that we're a part of here in uh, Edmondson Heights. And, and uh, we do welcome you here today. If you are uh, visiting with us this morning, we uh, would invite you to take the card that's in the chair back in front of you. And um, it's the welcome card. And uh, sign it and uh, let us know uh, who you are and how we can uh, connect with you and um, just help you to uh, get a little bit more uh, familiar with who we are as uh, Edmondson Heights community. And so uh, on the back of the card this morning, there's also an opportunity for you to fill out a um, prayer request. If you have a prayer request this morning and you would like to have the uh, elders and the prayer team pray for you, um, please fill out that card. And uh, you can drop both of them in the offering plates that are at the back of the, of the church this morning. So we, again, we welcome you this morning as we come to worship. And I'm going to turn it over to our worship team now to lead us. Good morning, everyone. I'll invite you to stand on your feet if you're able and willing. It is good to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. It is also good to be in the presence among each other. Amen. That's the church. You and I belong to the church. Amen. Okay, so don't don't let me sing along, okay? If I don't see you singing, I'll stop and make you sing. Again. I love to be in your presence with your people singing praises. Yeah. I love to stand in rejoice, lift my hands and raise. Let's do that again. I love to be in your presence with your people singing praises. I love to stand in rejoice, lift my hands and raise my voice. You said, yeah. you said my feet to dance and you filled my heart with song. You give me reason to rejoice, rejoice. You said my feet to dance and you filled my heart with song. Give me reason to rejoice. 
go, there we go. Hey, I love to be in your presence with your people singing praises. I love to stand in your arms, lift my hands and raise my ball. You said, yeah. is this 
King of glory He's everything to me Come on, let me hear you His name His name Such precious Jesus The Lord
His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Precious
Yes, Lord, all your promises are yes and amen. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Well, as we uh, transition now into our time in God's word, uh, we want to take a, a few moments just to uh, pray, quiet in our hearts, let our hearts be at rest in his presence, knowing that he is here with us and that he is able to let, help us let go of all the things that have been in our hearts, uh, where our hearts have been pulled this way or that way this past week with um, all the different things that are going on in our lives. And so let's just take a few moments. Uh, you, know, you, got, you guys can uh, head down now to, to settle in. And, and we will, uh, let's go before the Lord in prayer now. Let's listen to him speak to us. Lord, we thank you that we can come into your presence. We can sing songs of praise and, and thanksgiving for your faithfulness, your, your greatness, your awesome power that you have demonstrated for us in, in your creation and, and how you, you come to us every day and reveal yourself. And, and Lord, we do. We, we, we just want to give you that praise today. And yet, Lord, we also want to be able to come and sit in silence before you, where you can know the inner workings of our hearts. You can read the, our hearts, and we can offer up to you ourselves in and, and just that silence and the stillness so that we can begin to hear you speak to us the way that you minister to us through your Holy Spirit. And, and God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who who comes and, and abides with us and just leads us into that place of, of peace, that peace that passes all understanding. Holy Spirit, you're the one that keeps our hearts and minds together in Christ Jesus. And so we welcome your presence here today, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we ask this morning, Lord, that you would just give us your grace your grace to be able to have ears to hear and hearts to understand your word as it comes to us today. As you, you speak into us the words of life, I pray, Lord Jesus, that, that we, would ha we would respond with a yea and amen in you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for the ways that you you are at work in our lives for the way that you bring that 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 water that 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 water of life that bubbles up inside of us like we've been studying about with the, the woman at the well and, and lord when when your 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 spirit begins to to 
mesh with our spirits and as we begin to offer ourselves to you as we come to know you and as we live in you that that water of life just bubbles up and then flows over to others and so lord i just pray today that as we continue in our study of of your word today that you would just give us give us that confidence to be able to know to be still and know that you are god and that you have called us to be your people that new creation uh, reality being part of your forever family and having a, a message to bring to this world around us so lord give us ears to hear hearts to understand all that you have for us from your word today and we pray all these things in jesus name amen and amen i'm just going to ask um, our sound people to turn off the monitors at the front here if you could there good yeah that's good i i don't know if you you could hear it out there but i could hear a buzz right here <laughs> and, and for that's that's kind of a little distracting right it kind of takes us into oh actually we'll get to that in a moment because it takes us into a place that we'll we'll talk about in a moment but we're we're uh, beginning well we're not beginning we're continuing our uh, studies today in the book of john and um we're continuing the, the story that we started a couple weeks ago, uh, the story of the woman at the well. And today I've entitled this, this message, um, A Mystery Meal. A Mystery Meal. You know, when I was a student in uh, Bible college, and it seems like a long time ago <laughs> when that was now, over over 40 years ago, whew, um, I remember living in dorm. How, how many of you have ever had an experience of living in dorm when you were at university or college? Yeah. Well, you know that when you live in dorm, it's not quite like living at home, especially when it comes to meals, right? It's not mom's home cooking, but, um, you know, they, they do try. I know the cafeteria at uh, OBC tried to uh, give us balanced, nutritious, and usually palatable meals, you know? Uh, that's, that's, I think, every uh, university uh, cafeteria is like that. Or, you know, but it was everything that a young college student needed as I experienced what it was like to live away from home for the first time. But one thing I do remember is there were a couple of nights each week where the menu was changed up a little bit. And, um, well, my kids used to use the word sketchy. You know, the food was a little sketchy those, uh, those days. It was usually on the weekends when there weren't a lot of people around. And the uh, cafeteria would, or the, the kitchen would come out with, well, we called them budgie wings. <laughs> budgie wings, because they were the smallest chicken wings that you've ever seen, right? And then, and then they also came out at times with this, well, they called it on the, the, the board a breaded cutlet a breaded cutlet but you know every time we ask them what 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 is what's in this breaded cutlet they would say well, well they wouldn't actually tell us what was in the breaded cutlet it was what we lovingly called mystery meat and so that that was my experience at um at college and you know, I, I got to admit, though, the budgie wings and the mystery meat, they did taste somewhat good. Um, but, uh, you know, we, it was something that we had to get used to. Well, today, in our story of Jesus, oh, good. I'm not, you're going to have to help me, Gary. There, yeah, you can go on to the next one. Today in our story, oh, actually, you can stay there. Today in our story of, of Jesus, we're um, completing the story we started looking at last week. 
from John chapter 4. Last week, we focused on the conversation for life that Jesus initiated with the woman at the well in Samaria. Today, we're going to discover the impact that that conversation had on the woman and her neighbors and also Jesus' disciples when they returned to the well after shopping for food and found that Jesus had already eaten a mystery meal. Jesus, when uh, Jesus and the woman, uh, so let's put this story into, uh, into perspective. Jesus and the woman had just completed their conversation when the disciples returned to the well. And this is what John tells us. He says, just then, the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see the man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way towards him. Now, the rest of the story that we're going to look at today, John breaks up into three parts. And um, the story he tells, um, the first part is what we just read here, the return of the woman to town and the return of the disciples to Jesus. That's the first part of the story. Then what we're going to see is we're going to see Jesus talking about the mystery meal that he had just eaten. And then the final part is the impact, the impact that the woman had, her testimony had on the townspeople. So there, there's, there's, you know, the, the beginning of this, the second part of this story is the return of the woman and the disciples and the impact of the woman on the town. And then at the very end, we have the fuller impact of the, the, um, the woman's testimony in town. But in the middle, we have Jesus teaching what this is all about, what, what this whole story is all about. So let, let's come back to the, um, the first part of this story. You know, a questionable return. The questionable returns. You know, the impact of Jesus' declaration on this woman was beginning to resonate in her soul. When he had this conversation with her, the, the, the water of life started to bubble up inside of her and, and she couldn't contain her joy. She just had to go back to town and tell everyone what had just happened to her. So she left her water jar behind and she had run with all she could to, to share the good news that Jesus had brought to her life. You know, when she got to town, the transformation was noticeable. As she returned to town, she, she, when she had come out to the well, she was full of shame. She was full of resignation. You know, this woman had, was carrying a really heavy load in, in her life. And she had come out to the, the, the well at midday when no one else was there. Why? Because she didn't want to be seen by ever, anybody. She didn't want to be interacting with anybody because they all knew what her life was like. And she was feeling like an outcast in her town. Yet, after meeting Jesus, notice the transformation that had taken place in this woman. Her, in, she, she was, after meeting Jesus, she, she returned to town declaring to everyone that she could see, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did, the one who saw me for who I am, and who has now set me free 
to know eternal life, that know the Messiah who has come. Could this be, could this be the Messiah? Could this be? So she comes, goes running into town. She starts telling everybody and anybody she sees and asks that question. Hey, could this be? Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one that everybody's been waiting for? Could it be? Could it be? You know, her question was not one of uncertainty. Well, could this be or couldn't this be? No, her question that, that she, she shared with everybody was a question of urgency. It was a compelling question that prompted an unexpected result in the people's lives in, in that town. It caused people in the town to take notice of her. And this transformation that this woman usually just shied away from everybody. But what, what's going on with her? How come how the promised Messiah? We got to go and see what's going on here. We got to go and see what's going on. We got to check it out for ourselves. And John tells us that the townspeople came out of town and made their way towards Jesus because of the questionable way that this, this woman was now living. Inspired all kinds of questions for them as well. Well, we'll get back to that in just a moment in the last part of the story. There's more about that later, but I just want you to notice something. Notice how Jesus empowered a very unlikely person, a very unexpected person, a woman, okay, in his day, a woman now is empowered to be his witness, a Samaritan woman at that is empowered to be his witness, an unexpected person to spark a great awakening in Samaria. What an unexpected result from just one conversation with this woman. Well, let's move on to the next questionable return. And that's, and that's, that's Jesus' disciples when they come back from their mission that Jesus had given to them. Upon their return to the well, John tells us that the disciples were surprised to find Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman. This was so unexpected for them. And, and, and we know why it was unexpected. It was, it, it was unexpected for, because of all the cultural and spiritual reasons that we talked about a few weeks ago. You know, like how taboo it was for, for Jewish men to talk with with. Um, women and, and Samaritans at that, you know, all the different things going on there. And immediately, immediately in their minds, they could think of all the reasons why this was not a good thing. It was just not a good thing in their minds. All their prejudices, their biases, their religious points of view, the opinions of others, all started whirling around in their heads. They had all kinds of questions that they wanted to ask Jesus. And they were all right there. They, they were just, it was just, they were just so full of these questions. It was all just kind of buzzing around in their head. But they chose not to ask them. It's a good thing that they didn't. You know, they, uh, uh, a few years ago, in one of my personal growth and development courses that I participated in, I discovered that there's a name for what the disciples were experiencing as they were trying to process all the thoughts that were whirling around in their heads. It's called the morass. You know the morass? Um, they, they were stuck in the, the morass. 
And that might not be a, a familiar term for you right now, but you know what, what that, that, that morass is, I'm, we're all familiar with, maybe not the term, but what happens in our heads all the time. You know, there's the, the, the morass is that sea of opinions, those questions that you know, start to whirl around in our head, the contrasting points of view that we have, you know, we're trying to work all this stuff out in our head, you know, the shouldas, the couldas, the wouldas, the oughtas, that, you know, we're constantly being bombarded in our brains. You know, that, that place in our minds where we go to process all of our jumbled and conf conflicting thoughts. That's the morass. That's the morass. We all have a morass. You know, it's that also that place where that voice resides. You know the one I'm talking about? The voice? You know, that voice that just said to you, what voice? <laughs> Anybody have that happen <laughs> just now? Oh, what voice is that? What, what's he talking about? You know, the, I, do I, am I getting this? You know, you know those, those, that voice that is constantly there. Everybody have a voice like that? Yeah? Yeah, oh, yeah, and some of you are not wanting to admit that because you think that someone, you know, you don't want to, you know, be, you know, okay, they're a little, you know, if they hear voices. But, you know, we all do. We all have that inner voice. You know, Richard Rohr calls the, the voice, this voice, our loyal soldier. Our loyal soldier, whose job it is is to protect Get this, to protect our false self. Our false self. You know you all have a, we all have a false self? It was formed somewhere deep in our childhood. All the different things that, that have brought, you know, about our, our points of view and everything else. Those things that, that are all up in our morass get triggered by that, that voice, that loyal soldier whose, whose job it is is to protect our false self or... If you want to put that in, into biblical language in New Testament, our old nature, our old nature, our already always way of being, you know, that sin nature. The loyal soldier protects us in the sense, calling into question all kinds of things. Why? Because he's there to protect the false self, our old nature. And to try to keep us in that place of, 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 well, sameness. Sameness. He, he's there, you know, to, to try to, that loyal soldier in us is, is there to, to um, keep us, keep our old nature from being disturbed. Let's put it that way. Or our old nature being shaken up. Or shaken awake so that we can hear the voice of God speaking to us, calling us out of that already always way of being into a new and possible way of being that's the new creation that Jesus wants to, to bring to life in us. But we have this morass in which all these voices are, are, are pulling on us and, 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 and causing us to, to question, to have all kinds of questions, like the disciples had que questions. You know, it's from our morass that we can, we can be so reasonable. You know, that, that's what the, the loyal soldier tries to say. Oh, listen, just reason this all out, okay? Reason it all out with me. You know, we, we can reason what a person's going to be like. How they will react to us. You know, when we see someone in front of us, you know, or, or we're, you know, we, we want to talk with someone. Oh, well, you know, will they, will they really like me? Well, I don't know. They might not like you, you know. They, they, they might get upset with you. Oh, they might get offended by you. Oh, don't go and talk to that person. No, don't do this. Don't do that. You know, the voice in our head tells us all these things many of which are, are just not true about ourselves and about others. That's that voice of the loyal soldier protecting 
our old ways of being. You know, it's when we're in our morass that we have the tendency to prejudge other people and write them off as being too lost or even uh, to even consider the truth about Jesus. You know, why, why don't we, why don't we engage in, in conversations with, with people like the, the woman at the well more often? It's because, well, we're, we're, we're afraid to engage because, well, I don't know about them. So Jesus, thank goodness for Jesus. Thank goodness for Jesus who, who gives us, who models us for us and, and for his disciples, modeled for his disciples, models for us how to master our morass and to be unreasonable in our approach to people, accepting them for who they are and who they're not, creating an empowering context for conversations that can lead to life. And that's what Jesus starts to get to here with his disciples as he begins to explain to him them his mystery meal, mystery meal that he'd eaten. The disciples had been with Jesus for just a short time, but he was beginning to rub off on them. And so they chose not to, to, stay, to say what they had been thinking in their morass. They chose not to, to say anything to Jesus or the woman as she made her retreat back to town. They instead chose to focus on what was right before them. You know, Jesus had sent them on a mission into town to do the grocery shopping. And they had fulfilled that mission wonderfully. And on the way, they had, you know, they had uh, taken a few bites of the, the apples or whatever they had for, for breakfast or lunch. And, and they had, they'd come back and they, they, they were focused right now on the, the immediate concern that they had. And that was, well... We're, we're a little hungry, Jesus, uh, for a full lunch. You must be starved. You know, here, have something to eat. Have something to eat. Their first concern when they got back was, well, to, to make sure that Jesus was offered something to eat. And in John 31, verse 33, uh, G John tells us this. He says, meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, and this is amazing. He said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples went into their morass again, and they said, could someone have brought him food? Could someone have brought him food? You know, the disciples were, were taken aback at Jesus' response. Hadn't he just sent them into town to buy food, to get food? Well, how could he have food that they didn't know about? How, did, was Jesus holding out on them? Did he have a secret stash someplace? And with that, they were off again into their morass, and not just into their personal morass, but they, their morasses started talking to each other. <laughs> you know? How many times does that happen to, in, in, with us, right? One person goes off on a tangent, and then everybody gets off on a tangent, and everybody starts questioning, well, what's going on here? I don't, we don't understand. What, what, what's, what's Jesus talking about? This food that you know nothing about. What kind of food is that? It's, it's mystery food. What is it? They were questioning themselves and each other's trying to work out a reasonable explanation for how Jesus could have gotten his hands on a secret stash of food. They started focusing on things that weren't really what Jesus was wanting them to focus on. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying to them, which is, which, you know, when we look at the disciples as we're getting to know them from the book of John, that's par for the course, right? 
Jesus gives them some teaching. They start to kind of look at him with the deer in headlights kind of look and go, yeah, okay, I guess we know what you're talking about, I, but no, not really. And so this was one of those moments. The disciples didn't get it right away. They didn't get the things that Jesus was, was trying to teach them about this food that they knew nothing about. You know, and if we're honest with ourselves, we don't always get it either, do we? We don't always get it. We don't always get the fact that, you know, Jesus has something he wants to, to speak into our lives, but we're too busy being up in our morass, in our old ways of thinking, our old nature ways of thinking that we cannot hear the voice of the Spirit of God trying to nudge us in a new direction. You know, I, I'm thankful that, that Jesus took the time here to clarify what he meant regarding this mystery meal. You know, in, in John 4, 34, he says this to the disciples. He says, okay, you're not getting it, so here I'm going to explain it to you. My food... This mystery food that I'm talking about that you know nothing of. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. To finish his work. That, that's a really good passage of scripture to, to take and to reflect on. To meditate on. To just let that sink into your, your soul. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now the food that Jesus is talking about here is obviously not physical food. It's spiritual food. His nourishment and sustenance did not come from just eating, you know, uh, uh, you know, three meals a day, three square meals a day. You know, breakfast, lunch, dinner. That way it didn't, his sustenance didn't come from physical food. His sustenance came from doing, he says, the will of the Father. The one who had sent him to bring to completion the work of salvation bringing to people the gift of eternal life every day until the work had been finished. The work was finished. And, and this is what Jesus had done. This is what Jesus was doing. You know, he was right, this was right at the very beginning of his ministry. And, and he's inviting the disciples to come along with him in this, this mission of fulfilling the, the work that the Father, the will that the Father, the things that the Father had set up him apart to do. And to do them completely. To finish the work. So what was the work that Jesus was, was talking about here? What, what was this food that, that God had given him? What was the mission that the Father had sent Jesus on? It... it in, in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 21, we see what Jesus is talking about. He said, Jesus declared what he came to do as he read the scroll of Isaiah in his hometown synagogue in Capernaum that, that, at the very beginning of his ministry. You know, after he had, he had been out in the desert for 40 days and had not eaten for 40 days, but the Spirit of God had filled him and in the fullness of the Spirit, he came back to the, the synagogue in Capernaum and, and he declares that, that, that beautiful statement that's right in front of us now. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
You know, when he had finished reading the scroll, he declared that this scripture had been fulfilled in their hearing that, th that day, and, and, and that he was, by this, this passage of scripture from Isaiah, he was declaring, he was declaring, this is my mission. This is my mission that the Father has sent me on, that, is, that I am being empowered by the Spirit to complete his mission. His mission was to proclaim the good news of kingdom come. God's kingdom was bursting forth on this earth through him and through those he was calling out of the darkness into the light so that they too could proclaim the good news, and bring it to a world that's in darkness. You know, it was this, the fulfillment of this mission, doing the will of the Father in the power of the Spirit that fueled Jesus right through until his final days, the final days of his life as he went to the cross. You know, in, in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, we, get a, we, we have a really beautiful prayer from Jesus. You know, if you have an opportunity to, to reflect on that prayer, read it through and, and, and understand that this is Jesus as he's just about to go to the way, the way of the cross. He prays this beautiful, well, we call it the, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Because this is, a, this is a communication that he had between him and himself and God. And it's, it's his final checklist. You know, when, when, you're, when, you're, try, when you're on a mission and you want to complete the, the work fully, you, you know, you have a checklist of things that, well, did I do this? Yes. Did I do that? Yes. Did I do this? Have I covered all, of, all the bases? And this was what Jesus was doing in this prayer. He prays, Father... Father, I came to bring eternal life to all those you, who were given to me, those who would receive the gift of grace and truth. Again, check, check. And he says, I came to reveal the Father's love. Check. <laughs> I have come to give them your word, the word of God. Check. And I came to protect and keep them safe. Those, keep safe, those who were called and who were chosen by you to do this mission, to come and be a part of this mission with you. Check. It is complete. It is complete. I am filled to overflowing. I'm ready to go that final step. Now, Jesus' spiritual food, his nourishment throughout his whole ministry was to do the, all that he had been sent to do. His partnership in the Father's mission was what sustained him and fueled him in his life and ministry. Now, his words of, of clarification and instruction to his disciples here reads as a, an invitation to us. An invitation to, well, uh, first of all, to the disciples to step out of their morass-dominated way of thinking and to be transformed, to be nourished from within by a whole new way of being. You know, that's right out of Romans chapter 12. Don't be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed from within, as Eugene Peterson says, by a whole new way of thinking. A whole different way of thinking. The new creation mindset. 
He's encouraging us. Jesus is encouraging his disciples and us to take on the new creation mindset and mission priorities. That's, that's what this whole story is, is all about in terms of understanding what's going on in that middle section. He says to them, he continues on and he says to them, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. But I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. You see, this is the new creation mindset that Jesus is inviting his disciples to take on, to get out of their morass, take on this new possibility of partnering with Jesus in the harvest, the harvest of souls. He promised, G he promised the disciples when he called them, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will give you a whole new way, a whole new purpose, a whole new mission. And now he's inviting them to see through this whole interaction with this woman at the well, through what they, the questions that were in their hearts about being in Samaria of all places. He's calling them to say, look, open your eyes and see. The fields are ripe unto harvest. You know, every farmer, he says, knows that when you sow your seeds, you have to wait he says, four months here until you get a harvest. And he's saying, but you know, that's, that's, the old, that's an old way of thinking. Because he says, you know what? Today, when you what, open your eyes and look, the fields are, are ripe unto harvest. You know, you, you can sow today and you can reap today if you go out and to fulfill the mission that I'm sending you on. He's conflating the sowing and the reaping. He's bringing them all together into one. He's saying, you know, your, your morass may say to you that you're not ready or prepared, that I need more time. You know, I've, you know I've, I've come to know you, Lord Jesus, but I need more time before I can tell other people about you. I need more time to be able to to you know, grow in my, my understanding, my confidence of who I am as, as, as a child of God, my identity within you, I need more time. And what Jesus is saying here is, look, open your eyes, understand. Understand the, uh, who you are the way I see you now. Understand the, who, who the people are that that I'm bringing your way. Under, you know, open your eyes and see that the fields are ripe unto harvest. Open your eyes, open your heart, and see people the way I, I Jesus, sees them and the way I see that you see and see yourself the way he sees you. Now, Jesus is, is inviting his disciples to see things a very different way. And he's inviting us to do that as well. You know, with these words, Jesus was encouraging his disciples to partner with him and the Father in the harvest of souls that was right, ready, right there, ready for them to be a part of, to reap. These words of instructions about sowing and reaping are also for us. They're an invitation to partner with Jesus in the ongoing work of bringing the good news of eternal life to others around us. It's a clear call to partner with God in the mission that he is always engaged in. You know that? God is very actively engaged in the mission, the redemptive mission of this world. We may not see it all the time, but he is actively engaged in that all the time. And as Jesus said these words, the disciples looked across the fields. Oh, I just love this. You know, as he's saying this to the disciples, he says, look out at the fields. They're white unto harvest. And what do you think they saw at that point? They're, they're standing at the well, right? They're overlooking the city, overlooking the town. And all across the fields, all of a sudden, they see heads popping up. 
and people pushing their way through the fields, coming towards them. Because the woman had done her work. The woman who just came to know Jesus had gone and impacted a whole town. Hey, you think you're not ready? I don't think that woman thought she was ready to, to, to be used by God in that way. Unexpected, right? Well, all of a sudden, all of these heads are popping up. They're all coming towards Jesus. And he says, look, the fields are white unto harvest. They're white unto harvest. And he says, even now, even now, even now, the, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop of eternal, for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus, the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Now, Jesus Jesus had given this woman a taste of living water. It had started to bubble up inside of her. And she, in turn, had sown the words of life to her neighbors in town. And now they were coming out to see for themselves who this Jesus was. Jesus says the harvester was now reaping the harvest for eternal life. And this was truly, truly a great awakening in Samaria. And, and for Jesus' disciples who were starting to get it. Starting to get what Jesus was saying to them. Inviting them to do. This was a teachable moment for Jesus with his disciples and he shared with them as he shared with them the principles of sowing and reaping leon morris leon morris in his expository commentary on the gospel of john makes this observation he says we're engaged together in a great work the work of god one may plant another water one may sow and another reap but it is God and only God who can give the increase. We are all partners in doing God's work, channels through whom he accomplishes his purpose. If we understand what we are doing, and more importantly, what God is doing in this world, we understand that the harvest is the important thing. Not the part that this worker or that plays in bringing it about. As long as the harvest comes, sower and reaper can rejoice together. You know, this is the lesson that there's there for us as Jesus' disciples today. It's, it's there for us to discover. It's, a, it's something that... that we, we need to understand about this new creation mindset. Sometimes, sometimes in order for us to be able to fully participate with Jesus in the work that he desires for us to do, the work that he has created us in himself to do, you know, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the good things that God has prepared in advance for us to do. That's the mission that we have is to discover what is that that God has called us to do. You know, but sometimes for us to be able to fully participate with Jesus in that good work that he desires for us to do, we must get our heads out of the morass open our eyes, and see people the way that Jesus does. By getting ourselves out of the way, we can help others to come to know Jesus for who he truly is, just like this woman at the well. You know, the impact of this story is truly amazing. You know, in John's travel journal, his final entry on this story in his travel journal, John makes these final observations, John 4, 
39 to 42. He says this, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man truly is, really is, the Savior of the world. Wow. Wow. What an amazing, what an unexpected impact in, of all places, Samaria. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if that kind of impact was had here in Peterborough? In Peterborough. Where people come to see Jesus as really being the Savior of the world. And you know what? It's happening. It's happening right now. But, and it's happening with people who have a sense of God's mission. Who have, have, have got out of their own heads and have got the God. And we're doing it. They're doing it. And, and so this morning as we conclude this message from God's word, I, I, I've asked someone to come up and, and share a testimony about that about that work that's going on, the mission that's, that's being fulfilled, and how you also can be a part of that with them. And so I've asked Lauren Kennedy to come up today to share with us a testimony of how she and others, some from our own fellowship and around the city, are partnering with Jesus to reach out with the good news of eternal life. Lauren? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, yeah, so Pastor Ken asked me to share a little bit um, from my story and my journey in some of this. Um, and uh, what does it look like in terms of living water in my life? Um, so I do want to share some stories of, of how I have first of all, received the living water. Um, like the first part of this story is about the woman encountering Jesus for herself. Jesus meeting her in the places where she needs to be met. So for me, that's been the first step. So I'm going to talk about that, about receiving that living water. And then I'm also going to talk about um, giving that living water to others and sharing that. And out of that place and encounter of having Jesus met me that I'm then able to to share and see things around me um, so I'm just going to share a story and then I'll give you some of the backstory to it so um, it's pretty normal for me now this did not used to be normal for me um, where in my everyday life um, you know, sometimes I'll just get this sense that like, okay, you need to go talk to that person. This never would have happened five years ago. Um, so I'll just share one of those stories. So I was actually spending a day with God. So this is something I try to do once a week where this is how I receive living water. <laughs> um, I actually clear my schedule and I just spend the day resting with God. And it might mean reading the Bible. It might mean going for a walk. It might mean just doing normal things in a day, but doing it with the awareness, the intentional awareness that God is with me. Praying, um, just resting in my belovedness. I don't actually have to get anything done today. There's no agenda except to be with God. So that's one of the ways um, that I received that living water. So this was a day where I was doing that and I um, went to a coffee shop and I was gonna go for a hike. And so I was in this coffee shop 
I was in the bathroom and I saw this girl and I just, I just felt this like heaviness for her. I just felt this like something is happening and I feel like I'm supposed to talk to her, but I'm a little bit afraid and I don't really want to. And what Pastor Ken was talking about, all those thoughts, like what if she thinks I'm weird? Like, what am I supposed to say? Um, you know, all those thoughts are going on in your head, right? But I just, I saw her and I was like, oh, I feel like I'm supposed to talk to her. Um, but I didn't know what to say. So I sat down and I, like, I, I came out and I sat down somewhere in the cafe and was just praying and like, okay, God, I'll do it. But you've got to show up because I don't know what to say. <laughs> Um, so after a while, I um, was kind of waiting, because she actually worked at the cafe. So it, it's kind of an awkward thing to like find the right time, because she's busy and she's working. But I finally, people kind of stepped away from the counter. And I went up and I ordered something. I said, hey, this may sound a little weird. <laughs> um, but I've just been praying, and I just feel like, God just really wants you to know that he loves you. And her face just changed. And she, um, she looked at me and she said, what's your name? And I said, my name's Lauren. And she like, she was shocked. And she's like, my name's Lauren. And, and it was just this really beautiful moment where she opened up and shared like, well, actually, yeah, I've just had a really hard week. She'd been having a lot of mental health challenges, and it was her first day back to work and just feeling a lot of anxiety. Um, and so I said, can I, can I pray with you? And I, I was just able to share the love of God with her, and I prayed with her. Um, and it was just a really beautiful moment where I came away. I just got fed, um, where I got to be part part of what God was doing and sharing living water with other people. Um, and so, yeah, it was just this really beautiful moment where she got to experience the love of God and I got to experience the love of God, both for me, but also flowing out of me into the life of somebody else. So how did I get here? <laughs> because five years ago, if you had told me, like, you're going to, like, go up to a random person and pray for them, I'd be like, no, 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 that's not me, that's somebody else. Other people are really gifted in that, and I don't even hear God speak to me like that. Um, so I think two things, again, were really important for me in, in this. The first thing was receiving that living water, having mm -hmm. um, intentional practices in my life whether it's through Bible study, through prayer, through rest days, through just listening to God, um, abiding with God, um, taking time away and prioritizing that to just be with God, rest in him and grow in him, um, and just resting in our belovedness. The second thing um, is stepping out of our comfort zone in love. And so when we think about all those voices in our head, it's actually about letting love be the loudest voice. Mm -hmm. Letting the love of God actually trump all those voices. Like, yes, it's kind of scary to step out, but the love of God is greater than that. The love of God is more important. And this person in front of me is actually more important than my fear. <laughs> mm -hmm. And one of the things that really helped me in that was hanging out with people who lived like this. <laughs> Um, and so there's actually um, a group of people that kind of practice this every week. Um, and they, they gather together, they pray, they worship, they go out and they share the gospel with people. Um, they pray for people. They um, just love on people where they're at all over the city. And um, I started going to these and it was really stretching. Um, but through this, I actually learned that it was possible to, to hear something or, or just, to, just to talk to somebody who you don't know and to, 
um, share with them and have a really meaningful conversation. I didn't even know that was possible before. Um, and so um, this is actually an invitation that's open to each of you. Um, so every Thursday night, um, there are actually some people here that often go or have been to it as well. Um, so you can talk to any of us, but um, we, Thursday nights at seven o'clock, um, we happen to gather at Elam City Church, but it's people from all different churches. And we go out together and practice this. And what's so helpful is when you go with somebody else and you see them do it, then it's like, oh, okay. Um, like it's just, it just is much easier. And it's like, it was a big thing for me and how I got to this point where I was able to just do this in my everyday life. So you're invited. Um, November 30th is a Thursday night. Um, and I will be there that night at Elam City Church. Um, 6.30, there's gonna be a sign out sheet out the back. Um, and if you sign up, I'll make sure you have all the right details um, to come, but it's just an opportunity to practice this, to learn a couple of tools that make it easier to talk to people um, or to bring up faith and to talk about living water. Um, but also just to to be exposed to other people who are doing this. So, um, yeah, Thursday, November 30th at 6.30. Um, we'll just go a little bit earlier. But, yes, if you sign up, I will make sure you have all the right info. Um, but what I just want to close with is that people really are hungry. They're hungry for love, for acceptance, for meaning and purpose. Um, but when we actually receive the living water and give it, we experience, we get to experience that love. We get to experience that meaning and that purpose and that mission um, that God is inviting us to. And, <clears throat> and now for me, whether I'm in the lunchroom at work or whether I'm walking down the street, um, it's I get to be fed and I get to be part of what God is doing and so and that's, that's an invitation for all of us so thank you um, and uh, yeah feel free to chat with me more about any of this thank you so much Lauren not complicated very simple as we allow the spirit of God to really work in us and as we spend time, as Lauren said, spend time in, in the presence of, of Jesus as he fills us, as he feeds us with that food, that mystery food that we, we don't know anything about. But yeah, well, he's revealed it to us. He said, you know, come, abide with me, live in me, and I in you, And apart, because apart from me, you can't do anything. I will give you all that you need to be able to be my witnesses. I'm pouring out my spirit into you every day. And there are opportunities all around you. The fields are white unto harvest. Are you gonna respond today? Let, let's just, um, I, I invite the worship team to come back right up. Uh, we're going to uh, have some worship and, and close off our service. But before we, we do, I just like to pray. Lord, thank you so much for the way that you um, are speaking to us. You're reminding us these, of these simple things, Lord, to, to keep our eyes open, our hearts fixed on you so that, that you can use us in the work that you've created for us to do. The, you've called us to be your people who have been called out of the darkness into the light so that we can proclaim your goodness. We can be the salt and we can be the light in the world. So, Lord, just... Give us, um, give us a, a real desire to eat from this food, the food uh, to do the will of, of you who has called us and, and sent us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
that again. Psalms 34, 8, and it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Pray. 
Yes, yes, Lord, amen. We say yes. Say, yes, Lord, yes. for Giovanni coming in and leading us this morning and the worship team for their beautiful music together. Please be seated as we uh, conclude our service today with just a couple of announcements. Uh, the first is with regard to our congregational meeting that will be this Thursday evening. Lots on the go uh, for that meeting. We've got new members to be voted on. We've got a new budget. 
We've got uh, new officers for the, this coming new year, so come on out, be a part of this, um, this uh, meeting on Thursday evening, starting 7 p.m., and uh, might not, well, depends on how much conversation we have around some of these things that to go to 9 o'clock, but come on out and be a part of that congregational meeting. We have Bible studies here at uh, EBC, or EHBC. Um, Tuesdays, ladies' Bible studies meet. Uh, Wednesdays, the men's group meets. And um, if you're interested in either of those, you can talk to either uh, Sue for the ladies and um, Bob or, or um, what's your name, Bob? Bob's brother, Gary, Gary, my other brother, Gary. Right. Um, and so uh, the Bible studies. And we are going to be having a Christmas Eve in the afternoon service on Christmas Eve Sunday. Not a morning service, not at our normal time, but we're having a three o'clock in the afternoon service to, to celebrate Christmas together. And if, you'd wanna, if you wanna be a part of the Christmas choir, it's gonna be starting up pretty soon. Um, please speak to Enrico for, with, um, for more details. Um, coming up as well, oh, actually, Christmas is coming, so we have our, our um, Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child, and as you can see, all these boxes have been lovingly packed by each one of you, um, or uh, members of the congregation here. And um, this morning, as we, um, we say a big thank you for all of you who have done the packing on these boxes. These boxes will go to children around the world um, uh, who wouldn't otherwise get a, a gift at Christmas time. And it's not just the gifts that are in this box, it's the gift of salvation as they receive the, the, um, the, a word about, uh, about Jesus as the, the boxes are distributed. So um, at this point, we just wanna just take a few moments just to, um, to lay our hands on the, these boxes. And, and you know, you're sitting out in the seats there, so you're not able to do that here with me. But just raise your hand up towards these boxes because we just want to pour out God's blessing on them as they go from this place around the world. So let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege it is to be part of your mission. And part of that mission is to reach out to children. You said, suffer the little children to come unto me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And Lord, I, I just praise you and thank you that we have the opportunity each year at this time to partner with Samaritan's Purse to pack these boxes, these shoe boxes that will go to children and in different places around the world. And Lord, so I, we just pray your blessing upon each and every one of these packages. Lord, that the, the children that um, you, that will receive them will not only receive these gifts with joy, but will also have the opportunity to come to know you, Lord Jesus, as their Savior and Lord. So, Lord, we just pray that you would watch over the, these boxes and all the boxes that are being collected um, from around the, the city of Peterborough, all the, from Ontario, and, and are heading off to uh, di different places in the world, Lord. We just pray your protection over them, that all these boxes would be received with joy. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your good blessings to us in Jesus. And in his name we pray, amen, amen. These are the, the final announcement for today is with regard to prayer. If you've been here today and God's been speaking to you in your heart and, and uh, you would like prayer following the service for anything that... Um, you know, for your being ability to be able to get out and, and witness to other people or just prayers for your physical well-being, your health, or, or whatever it might be for you, just uh, please take the opportunity. There'll be someone in the, the prayer room after the service today. and We'd love to be able to pray with you. Uh, these are the announcements at this time. So please uh, join with me as we uh, say together, stand with me as we say together our closing benediction. Hmm. All right, 1 Timothy 6, 15 to 16. We pray that God will bring about in his own time the blessed and only rule, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, 
who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. And now may you go in peace in Jesus' name. Peace be with you.